Oh, it's been it's been a bit of a week. Mm. Yeah. I just want to start with. So, I mean, you've been an MP now for five years. You were elected in 2019. You're one of the few remaining socialist MPs. How does that feel in Parliament? Well, I think I came in at a time when a few of us were elected as socialist uh, uh, MPs. I was very proud to be part of a group uh, that was elected, which uh, meant that it's been deemed uh, the most diverse parliament ever. So I think more of us who are socialists that got elected in 2019 are younger from ethnic minority backgrounds, uh, working class and women uh, as well. Mm. Yeah, and I think um, that's something I think we... We think there should be a lot of, um, uh, you know, celebration about. Um, uh, but I think that the journey has been very, very difficult indeed. Can you talk to me a little bit about that journey? I think initially, I think even before I got elected, um, I think even from the point where I uh, decided to stand uh, to be elected, I faced horrific abuse. Um, uh, the, you know, I think as politicians, we we expect scrutiny, we expect challenge. You know, we expect questions to be asked of us as to, you know, why we think we're the right people for the role. Uh, but what I experienced even from very, very early on wasn't that. Um, there was intrusion, there was attack, there was uh, a level of abuse that was extremely um, uh, high in terms of volume. Uh, but also um, widespread, it came from lots of various different directions, actually. Um, and that was very difficult, and I think that that intensified after I got elected in particular. For, for myself, I saw that. I mean, we hear a lot about MPs fearing for their safety. That's something that is it's cross-party. Most MPs complain about it. But with you, it's different. I mean, we're talking about serious death threats, not just comments on Twitter. Yeah, that's right. And I, in one of my more recent speeches uh, that I made uh, in the King's speech, where I mentioned Islamophobia because I felt it was omitted in the King's speech, uh, when we know that racism has increased all across the board in the country, um, I've, I felt I needed to mention that in part because I am the first and only hijab wearing MP. I felt that that's made me the target of quite visible racism in particular. Um, and, and so whilst, of course, I recognise that others are facing uh, abuse and threats, and none of that is acceptable, I just recognise that my own experiences have been particularly pointed in that direction in terms of my identity as a hijab wearing MP, in terms of my identity as a Muslim woman, socialist. Mm. I mean, in that King's speech, you talked about a heightened risk to your own personal safety. I mean, and then a couple of months later, I think it was Raymond Shisti who was talking about uh, that the Conservatives needed a report into Islamophobia in the party. I mean, has anything changed since you made that speech? Nothing has changed. I think, in fact, it's gone worse. And I think that the most recent reports about the increase in Islamophobia has shown a dramatic increase, a, a drastic increase in Islamophobia. I think it's a very frightening time. I often think that it's amazing to see people's resilience. And I've seen a lot of that even among the Muslim community. But I think it's fair to say that a lot of people feel frightened to become targets once again. I don't think that ever went away, but I think it's intensifying and it's a very, very worrying and frightening time. How much of that comes from the sort of ramping up of rhetoric that we've seen over the past couple of months? I mean, we've got op-eds that are being written by the former Home Secretary, Suella Braverman. We've got uh, comments made by former Conservative MP Lee Anderson. You've got a former minister, Paul Scully, saying that certain areas are no-go areas. I mean, how much is attributed or attributable to the rhetoric that is coming from the Conservatives? What happens in the public domain has a ripple effect in society. So, you know, I look at myself as being, again, as I mentioned before, the first and only hijab wearing MP. I think about what that symbol means. I got elected at a time when uh, Boris Johnson, who was then Prime Minister, made the comment about Muslim women in letterboxes, which was directly shown to have correlated with the increase in hate crime by 300%. So what happens and what is said at the top by people at the top has a ripple effect in society. And I think that um, that's why it's really important uh, that politicians, uh, you know, uh, speak in a way that is inclusive, that, you know, that actually embody 
the values of inclusivity, but instead what we are seeing is not the solutions to the crises that we we face in our country, but scapegoating, whether that's you know black people and and uh, migrants. Uh, um, we're seeing through you know various bills that are coming through in Parliament, whether that's the Muslim community and others, um, the trans community, uh, all these things that are uh, perpetuating even more hate, division and intolerance. And I think it's unacceptable. Um, and I think people see what is happening to politicians as well. So the sharp end of receiving um, abuse threats um, because of their identity, I think that also, that also means that 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 has an impact in terms of what happens in society and people feeling the impact of that racism, that misogyny, um, that is perpetuated in, in politics as well. Do you think it gives people, or well, the public, license to act in a way that is, well, racist? Well, I think it does. It gives, this, it gives the green light, certainly, uh, to some groups, I'd even say, uh, to feel emboldened. And you mentioned the uh, comments about um, even MPs suggesting that some areas are no-go areas. That was my area, Tower Hamlets. And I'm increasingly concerned about the targeting of our area uh, by far-right activists and activism. Uh, you know, the idea that um, this is a no-go area when we have a rich tradition of standing up for our rights, welcoming refugees, welcoming migrants. Um, and it's something that is very, uh, something that we're very proud of. Um, but you know, we we have uh, we have a very diverse community, and it it does definitely feel like we were targeted in that way, and that allowed for even more targeting on top of that because it allows for certain groups to feel emboldened. How often do you face the threat from the far right? Very often, I think that most of the uh, abuse, uh, the targeting of me, is from the far right. Um, it's misogynistic, it's racist, and it's very graphic. Uh, it's of various different uh, natures, but you know, th I, I would say it's threats to my safety, it's threats of violence. Um, I've had threats to rip my hijab off, so directly relating to how I look, um, and uh, it goes on and on and on. Yeah. How do you go about your normal day, knowing um, that you're receiving those threats? I think before being elected, I think. You know, I saw that MPs face abuse and are facing abuse, and we knew that at least one MP had been killed uh, at that point, Joe Cox. And I think still nothing prepares you for uh, what you may get. But I think what I recognise that it has changed my life. I now have to consider every single thing I do every single day in every area where I live, how I go to work, where I work. Um, I have to consider every single step and a risk assessment takes place every single day and it has to keep uh, being reassessed depending on the situation. Um, that's not how things should be, I don't think, but that is, uh, it reflects the, the, kind, the nature of the threat and the level of the abuse as well. You have a risk assessment. That's right. Yeah. Uh, my team and I have to consider many different things in terms of uh, my public appearances, uh, my visits, my meetings um, from various different perspectives um, and we have that fed in by uh, parliamentary authorities um, and we have to also feed things into uh, their processes as well uh, to make sure that we are you know, doing everything we possibly can to keep ourselves safe. The government have said that they've, uh, they're going to allocate 117 million extra pounds towards the safety of Muslims over the next four years. But, I mean, I, I find that confusing because as the rhetoric is ramping up, you're also allocating funding. I mean, well, firstly, is that funding helpful? And secondly, is it just politicking? I'm sure that it's welcome by mosques, for example, who've mm. had bomb threats. I know that in my area, a mosque has had two bomb threats. And I'm concerned about whether there was any follow-up um, in that way. So I'm sure... Uh, funding is welcome, but I'm not sure it's the answer. I think that communities need to feel that they are valued and they are empowered and that um, they're not being pitted against each other. Um, and I, I don't see enough of that. Um, I don't think securitization is going to uh, solve these problems. I think calling out racism when you see it, where you see it um, uh, at the top, uh, you know, going down is incredibly important. And I think not tolerating uh, racism is incredibly important. 
you know, and, and, and tackling things uh, by being able to define them, I think, is one step that could be done. But we don't see those things happening. So I, I don't believe that securitization is the answer. I worry uh, that um, uh, the debate around MP safety as someone who has been facing threats since even before the recent period, um, you know, I'm very aware of the fact that it's really important that Parliament can function, that we can do our work as MPs, um, and that uh, our principles of democracy are, are maintained and implemented. When you talk about defining racism, I know that that, that probably bleeds into the extremism report that Michael Gove announced yesterday. But, I mean, is there also something to be said about Lee Anderson and the comments that were made and Number 10's refusal to not define them as Islamophobic? I think there is a problem uh, of not defining Islamophobia and not calling it Islamophobia. Um, you know, we have the UN, the United Nations uh, Day to Combat Islamophobia. Some world bodies have already uh, adopted a definition. Um, some local councils have passed, uh, you know, definitions and accepted a definition of Islamophobia. So I do find it particularly difficult to understand why the government can't, uh, you know, accept or, or uh, have a definition. Um, and I think that the the incidents of Islamophobia, uh, for example, within the Conservative Party, are are noted and and they have been evidenced uh, by some of their own members experiencing Islamophobia, even within cabinet. Should we talk about Diane Abbott? That is actually one instance where Number Ten were able to define what is racist and what isn't racist. It, it did take Rishi Sunak all day to get to the point, but he did. I mean. Why do you think he's able to call that racist, but he's not able to call what Lee Anderson said? I can't explain that, but I think that Diana Abbott really is a trailblazer. You know, she she is an icon uh, in the British political community, and particularly uh, in the uh, British black community. And you know, her experiences of racism, uh, you know, as the first black woman MP as one of the first black MPs in Parliament, is well documented and is well evidenced. She has spoken about it numerous times. It's well understood that she was the target of the most amount of abuse in the 2017 uh, elections, according to Amnesty mm. International. So um, as much as it maybe in some ways did not come as a surprise that she became the target of uh, racism, as, re as has been reported, that Frank Hester um, uh, made in, in terms of his comments, I think that you know, it's important, uh, particularly because there was uh, the alleged threat of, uh, you know, that she should be shot, which I think definitely needs to have the Prime Minister's intervention, particularly because that is a Conservative uh, Party donor uh, who's alleged to have made those comments. That donor is still uh, donating to the party. So, I mean, there hasn't, doesn't seem to have been a lot of uh, recompense here. So words matter, but actions matter as well, they need to be followed up swiftly with actions and measures. And so, of course, it, it doesn't, I'm sure it doesn't make her any, feel any more safe, um, given that the situation is persisting. You sat next to her during Prime Minister's questions when she, uh, well, she, she tried to get the Speaker's attention, I think it was 46 times. I mean, what did that feel like, sitting next to her? I think in Parliament, sitting next to her, what I was very conscious of that it ended up being the case that she was spoken about or spoken for uh, mostly by men and in the end she doesn't get to speak for herself. So I can't explain the decisions um, and, and why that was the case but it just, I think myself and many colleagues just felt that she could have been given the chance to, to speak for herself um, and she was bobbing as you say numerous times. It just, it just didn't feel right. Did he look over? Um, I don't know, but I think you know she was wearing red, and she was she was visibly seen. Many colleagues looked at her, looked her way when she was being spoken about. I think when if she wasn't in the room, um, things may have been different. When someone is in the room and and they're being spoken about, spoken for, um, you know, we do get some sometimes it's an opportunity at the end, perhaps to maybe take extra questions. As I say, I can't explain that decision making, but but I just feel it felt really fundamentally wrong. Uh, that uh, she's spoken about and spoken for and in the end she doesn't get a chance herself even though it's very clear she's indicated that she would like to speak. Did you discuss with her at all about what she wanted to ask? No, I didn't. Um, I came in a few minutes uh, before. Um, I would not be surprised if it was to address 
uh, the situation and, and the comments uh, that have been reported to be said about her, not least because I think, you know, as a colleague of hers who's, you know, much newer to Parliament, it's incredibly frightening. And I think she has said as such, you know, she has made clear um, that uh, this is, uh, you know, she, she goes about her her life, she comes out of her home, she should be able to walk in the streets of Hackney. Um, and, you know, I, I'm sure this these things are weighing really heavily on her mind in terms of her own safety. Um, and, that's, and that's even though she's faced a lot over the years. Mm. Um, I was particularly moved by her statement to Good Morning Britain, where she, you know, talked about just, you know, uh, being alone, walking around the streets, something that any human being, whatever you do in your life, whether you choose to be in politics and public life, should be something that should be, uh, you know, afforded to you. Mm. You know, the ability to walk down the streets, the ability to uh, go about, get on public transport. And I was particularly moved by that, and I, I felt like I re it resonated with me um, that something like that happening to her, um, you know, c that could lead to violence, could lead to even more threats towards her. Um, uh, that she she felt the need to have to say that as well in response to to the comments uh, reported to have been made. I mean, it was quite a powerful image looking at the three of you. You were sitting with Zara Sultana as well, and you were you were flanking Diane Abbott on the benches. It's quite a powerful image because all three of you are trailblazers in your own right. How careful have the Labour Party been about protecting your safety or making a space for you? I mean, does Parliament still feel like it's catering towards older white men? I mean, I think that these are incredibly big milestones. I think that, you know, I've been contacted by people up and down the country about how seen they feel because they mm. see a visible Muslim woman like me in Parliament. And that's great, but I wish I could tell them uh, in the way that I felt I could before, or maybe a few years ago, that, you know, come and join and, you know, be part of something. Uh, but I'm more hesitant uh, now than I was then, uh, because the reality of it is, is that it's so hard and you don't feel always supported or adequately supported. And I think, you know, you mentioned my friend and colleague, Zara Sultana, and even just this week, she mentioned uh, that parliamentary authorities uh, told her that she'd been the target of quite serious, the most serious abuse and threats on social media alone. I mean, she is the youngest uh, uh, ever elected Muslim MP. And what message does that send to young people up and down the country um, about uh, being involved in public life and be getting involved in politics and having their voice heard? I don't think it sends a good message at all. Um, and, and likewise, I think that, you know, I haven't felt adequately supported by my own party uh, in terms of my experiences uh, coming forward as a survivor of domestic abuse um, and, and as uh, the first and only hijab wearing MP, which I think that, again, for my party, where we do have a track record of celebrating our diver diversity and inclusion, I, I question that now, given my own treatment. I mean, you and, you and Zara are two very visible MPs. You're, you're often out in your communities or you're, you're out campaigning. I've met you many times at various strikes, um, mm. I've interviewed you at many strikes. But what's interesting to me is some of the, the two of the most high profile in terms of your safety being compromised, you're also the two most visible. Because it, I mean, a lot of MPs, they go back to their constitu constituencies of a weekend and you don't see them. They don't, you know, they're not that interested in getting involved in anything. So why do you keep putting yourself out there? Why do you keep making yourself visible? I think that I recognise how difficult it has been, and, and it is, and it probably will be going forward. Um, it's been pretty horrendous and horrific. I think I do recognise that I, I feel a sense of responsibility and duty uh, to not be deterred by what's happening. Um, I think that relates in, in part mm. to my experience as a survivor of domestic abuse. Again, I, I have women reach out to me all the time, um, and I don't want to... I don't want to, I guess I don't want to be in a place where where it appears as though survivors of domestic abuse can't be in public life. And I think that would be quite difficult to take um, and to feel that domestic abuse survivors couldn't be MPs. Because I think that it's really important to be able to participate in shaping public policy and legislation. It's so crucial and I was really pleased that you know, we had the landmark piece of legislation, uh, the Domestic Abuse Act 2021, and I was you know, pleased to be able to play a role in, in, in that. Um, but it's such a prevalent issue in society. Um, 
I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to be part of seeing my voice diminished. Um, as a survivor of domestic abuse, I feel that it's really important to be, continue to be heard and uh, to send a signal that it is possible to, to remain and to be in public life, even if you're not getting the support adequately at a sufficient level. Are they safe? Can you be safe as a survivor of domestic abuse? Um, I think if you get the right support, I think it is possible to tackle it wherever it happens, uh, where, whichever workplace, whichever political party you belong to. Um, people meet, meet each other in every, uh, in every place in society. Uh, they meet each other in political parties as well. Mm. So the idea that it might, the domestic abuse might perpetuate itself in one environment, not the other, is not the reality. Uh, it can happen in a political environment, as relationships do. Um, as abusive relationships can do as well. Um, and what I've been seeking is justice in that regard, support in that regard, and just my due rights uh, to be supported, to, to have, to be able to be free and safe um, and an equal and fair chance to be a Labour Member of Parliament. And you're a trailblazer in that regard. Um, Paul Scully, going back to his comments, about Tower Hamlets, you're one of two MPs that represents um, the borough. Why do you think he describes it as a no-go area? I don't know. It's very strange that he, he did, and at the moment he chose to do that when there is so much racism uh, being stoked um, at the highest levels, uh, so-called culture wars and division, because the area that I represent is so diverse and people stand together against these things. So, And we did straight away when we... we uh, heard his comments um, you know we we have a proud tradition of standing up for our rights and, and celebrating our diversity you know in my constituency you know we've got a rich tradition of the battle of cable street uh, the anti-fascist anti-racist fight back in in brick lane on the other side so it, it's very strange to sort of um, see that characterization but i do feel that um, going forward for example, into what's happening next, which you know looks like a general election. Um, it's really important that all political parties recognise that some areas, people in some areas, will be feeling quite vulnerable and targeted. Um, and uh, I think areas such as mine have sometimes been characterised as though we don't engage beyond or outside of our areas when we're in some ways as diverse as other areas as well. So. Um, it's, it was very worrying, it was very frightening, I think, for people to see that, not least because we, have, we are becoming again and again targeted by the far right. And I think it only feeds mm. and in, in, empowers that one particular group and that one particular type of people. Um, again, which could you know, incite violence, which could lead to violence, which could uh, lead to people feeling quite unsafe in our areas. So um, I think that's why it was quite dangerous what he, he said. Um, and these things have real, uh, you know, real impacts on the ground in our areas. Well, it was cheap. It was a cheap shot. Yeah, I think it was a cheap shot. I think it was, uh, it's incredibly unfair uh, um, and unjust. And I think it's obviously not true. Mm. And, uh, but, but the reality is that you know, people have been feeling quite vulnerable in the recent period and um, it makes us more of a target. And that worries me greatly. There's been a decision um, in the last couple of days to remove Palestinian flags from council buildings in Tower Hamlets. That was a decision taken by the, uh, the mayor. Is that something you agree with? I think we need to support uh, people's right to express uh, their solidarity. Uh, we need to protect freedom of speech. We need to protect the people's rights to uh, protest. And I think, you know, flying a flag, coming out to protests, um, wearing symbols are a real important part of protecting that right. Um, and it's something that's part of our British traditions going back years and years and decades and decades, and something that we're really passionate about in our local area. So I think it's important to try and uh, make sure we protect that in, in whatever way we can. Um, and I'd like to be able to see again that, um, you know, where we've seen uh, flags raised in other areas, we've seen expressions of uh, solidarity in other areas, um, all of that to be able to be uh, protected and, and people to feel 
empowered to be able to do that. I've I've been on uh, I've been at the a lot of the national demonstrations, um, and a lot of people from my constituents, my area, have gone on to those uh, uh, demonstrations, peaceful protests. Um, we need to allow people to be able to express themselves, um, their grief, their rage, their anger, uh, as to the injustices that they're seeing. Um, and I think you know people have, people demonstrating have shown. Uh, that uh, they are doing so in in peaceful ways, and I think that's that's what's important here, protecting that right to be able to do so. Um, I know in in areas such as East London, you know, we have a, also a tradition of of raising money, charitable efforts uh, when we see catastrophes happening around the world. Again, these are things that should uh, be able to be protected. I'm worried that what's happening now in terms of the government's approach to these protests um, is incredibly uh, divisive but also quite dangerous because I think that, um, like I said, people need to be able to feel that they can, you know, express their right, uh, or the rights um, uh, to protest, to disagree with the government. But I recognise that what's happening right now is set in the context, in quite a chilling context of um, attempts to suppress uh, uh, protest Mm. Um, and, and dissent, uh, which has been going on for the last few years under this government, you know, draconian legislation, anti-protest bills more widely um, uh, that are being passed through Parliament, um, attempts to shut down the right to strike, um, looking at uh, the minimum services uh, level uh, uh, bills. So it's happening in that context as well. So I do think that this is uh, something that the government is um, deciding to do set in that context and set in that political program of uh, trying to um, uh, stop um, these expressions of solidarity which are incredibly positive and bring people together in this country. If the Palestinian flags are coming down, do you think that the Ukrainian flag should also be brought down? I think that one of the things that we've seen in the last few years is questions around consistency of policies and standards and I think that you know, um, it's right that people be able to, uh, you know, express solidarity with um, what's happening in terms of the invasion of Ukraine. And likewise, you know, people should be able to uh, raise their flag um, uh, in expression uh, of solidarity with Palestinian people. So, of course, I mean, there, there just needs to be an ability uh, to apply our democratic principles fairly and consistency, uh, consistently to all people. Mm. Were you concerned by reports that uh, members of the Jewish community didn't feel safe in areas where there were many flags put up in Tower Hamlets? Mm. I think that it's important to uh, engage and listen to all communities. Um, I personally would say that um, how, you know, the government hasn't necessarily invested in making sure that everyone feels safe. Um, Securitisation is not necessarily the answer to that. But I think empowering communities is really, really important. And I don't feel that I'm necessarily seeing that. So I think that it's really important uh, that the government take more, more of, uh, you know, of a step towards that. I'm not hopeful that that's going to happen. But I recognise that it's actually the, the intolerance division is actually being stoked um, you know, from, from government policy. And I think that's, that's what is um, having the impact up and down the country. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you.